Um, this so this session is going is being recorded and it will be available soon on HLA's YouTube channel. Um, before we launch into today's program, I'd like to tell you about our upcoming programs. Uh, on July 13th, we'll have a program about construction and renovation projects in libraries. The panelists will be Sarah Kamibayashi of Naalehu Public Library, Wade Oshiro of Leeward Community College Library, and Mitch Joseph of UH West Oahu Library. And then on uh, August the 10th, we will have a session featuring Janelle Kirante and Ani Kawada, who will be talking about the Ulu Ulu Moving Image Archive. So I hope that you will all be able to join us for those two sessions. We will be sending out the sign-up information as we get closer to those dates. Um, the Next Steps Committee uh, consists of myself, Jessica Hogan, Kimo Nichols, and Lynette Teruya, and we uh, work very hard to come up with programs and speakers of interest to HLA members and the library community. So if you have ideas about programs that you would like to see, or if you would like to be a presenter, please let us know. Um, you can also uh, look at the HLA website, hawaiilibraryassociation.org, for our upcoming events and to get in touch. So today uh, we'll be hearing from David Gustafson and Jonathan Young about ChatGPT and libraries. Um, we are delighted to have these two distinguished speakers. David Gustafson is a humanities librarian at Hamilton Library at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He obtained his MFA from Syracuse and he has an MLS degree from Indiana University Bloomington. Jonathan Young is the natural science librarian at UH Manoa Library. He has an MS in Computation and Neural Systems from Caltech. He got his MLISC from UHM, and he also received his doctorate in Communication and Information Sciences from UHM. So thank you to both of our presenters. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. All right. Um, and Jonathan, you're going to be running the slides, right? Yes, I am. They should be up now. Okay. All right. Um, so we were just introduced. I'm David Gustafson. Uh, Jonathan Young is the other person who's going to be uh, talking today. Um, we're going to begin with, in addition to our, our biographies, a little bit of uh, extra introduction. If you could uh, go to the next slide. So first, a uh, caveat. We're librarians. Uh, like the rest of you, we're not computer scientists. Uh, and specifically, we're academic librarians. We are part of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, so that means that we're not public librarians, we're not school librarians. Rather than attempt to try to translate our thoughts on how uh, ChatGPT and similar technologies are going to impact your work, uh, we figured it would make more sense for us to talk about how we're using it and the impacts that we're seeing and you can then uh, translate that and adapt that to your particular situation. Um, we're also not going to go into detail about how this AI technology works. Um, that's very complicated and frankly, it's, it's above my head. Um, it's also worth noting that this workshop is based originally on a workshop that we gave to graduate students at UHM uh, on using ChatGPT uh, that we then adapted for uh, talking to uh, our own library. So if we could go to the next page, next slide. So our, our um, objectives for today, our game plan is we're gonna talk first about uh, what AI is, especially generative AI and how it works. Uh, get more specific about that GPT, talk about its impacts in higher, in higher education, um, and then talk about how those larger impacts affect our little world in library land um, and hopefully start a discussion. Um, so the first thing that we wanna talk about is, is what is generative AI? Um, you're probably familiar with what's called predictive AI, even if you don't know it by that name. Uh, predictive AI typically is, is something that says, is this thing that I have here an example of this? So your spam filter on your email that automatically detects what it thinks is spam and sorts it in, that's uh, predictive AI. Same with any sort of a recommendation system. Um, 
a lot of uh, what Google or the way Google organizes pages is done with AI um, engagement algorithms. If you're a doctor looking at diseases, sometimes artificial intelligence will be used to uh, help diagnose things. My favorite example recently of this is that the Greek government uh, used uh, aerial photo photographs and used an AI program to try to find um, pools that were not being taxed. Um, and so they, using those photographs, used AI to say like, this house is a pool here and this house has a pool here and you're not paying taxes on, uh, on your property the way that you should. So we're not talking about predictive AI today though. Instead, we're talking about uh, generative AI. But generative AI instead, instead of asking if something is an example of it, it creates something entirely new. So instead of saying, is this email an, an example of spam email? It says, write its own, write your own email or create an, a beautiful image, uh, create a social media post, describe something based on uh, a prompt. Um, I'm going to give some examples here based on images, um, mostly because we're talking in a video format and that's a lot easier to communicate in text, but a similar thing is going on in text as well. So here you can see just how quickly things are changing. This is uh, an image produced using a, a prompt in April 2022 and the same prompt creating a new image in April 2023. So in just one year, uh, AI image generators have gone from something that looks, you know, it's identifiably human, but you can also tell that a computer made it. It, it looks warped, the eyes look especially weird, to something that looks almost photorealistic. Um, this is especially the case uh, if it's working with training data that there's a lot of uh, examples of on the internet. So if you could go to the next slide, Jonathan. Images of people who there are a lot of examples of. Uh, AI is especially good at taking them and making false images. So this uh, photograph photograph of the Pope that went viral about a month ago, uh, the Pope never wore this jacket. In fact, this jacket never existed. Um, same with uh, this trip to the beach that uh, Barack Obama and Angela Merkel took. Uh, that never happened. We, they have probably been on the beach together at some point. Uh, but they were certainly not uh, jumping in the waves and full suits. And uh, this is actually part of a series of images where they have ice cream on the beach and uh, generally just enjoy uh, their time. Um, AI can do, so AI can do photorealistic things, but it can also work in a variety of different styles. These are all examples of AI images that uh, have been created just using text prompts. So you can see it, it's not limited to trying to mimic photography. It can do uh, more fantastic or abstract things as well. Um, so similarly in text, uh, this is what uh, an AI written essay would look like in 2020. Um, so if you ask, ask AI in 2020 to describe the reasons for the US Civil War, um, you read this, uh, it's easy to identify why the Civil War happened because so many people and so many books and so much television and films tell us what the cause. This looks like an essay that maybe a middle schooler wrote uh, the night before it was due without doing any research and without doing any editing. So it, and maybe that's being uh, harsh on middle schoolers. It's, it is grammatically correct, but it's not a very good essay. This is not uh, not good writing and probably not uh, that great of a description of uh, the causes of the Civil War. Uh, in contrast, uh, this is what it came up with uh, last year. Um, and if you read this, it looks like it could be actually a pretty good encyclopedia description of the causes of, uh, of the Civil War. Um, and actually, we didn't show the, the full uh, list in here, but it continues on with, I think, about five or six different causes and gives detailed descriptions of each using extremely good natural language. So this is not necessarily a replacement for uh, you know, professional historians descriptions of the causes of the Civil War. But if a freshman college student or you know, it, it, 
produce this in a class, it would probably get a very good grade. Um, so AI is moving very quickly here. And here you can see uh, where AI is, is placing on standardized tests. Um, GPT 3.5, that's what most people think of as chat GPT. Uh, it's since been uh, replaced by GPT 4, which is a slightly better uh, model. Um, you can see GPT 3.5 was already doing well on some tests, like uh, the AP Art History exam and uh, AP Environmental Science. Um, GPT-4 uh, got about a 90% on the U.S. bar exam. So there are still some areas where it it's, needs some work, but it's extremely impressive. Um, so what, oh, if you go back there, what is ChatGPT? ChatGPT is an example of, of what's called a large language model. It's generative AI. And what it does is it predicts the next word given previous context. So given what you ask it to give um, and given the other words that it's produced. So it's a lot of people when they begin using ChatGPT or, or programs like it, they treat it like a search engine. They'll try to like type in, you know, what are the best restaurants in Honolulu or um, what are, you know, even something like what is the cause of the civil war? And that's not the way that you should be using, uh, you should be using a program like this. Uh, it doesn't actually have any information. It's not a search engine, it's a language engine. It produces, it, given language will produce more language. Uh, the metaphor I like to use is that if the autocomplete on your phone is a baby, uh, chat GPT is a teenager. It still has some growing up to do, but, it's much more capable, can do an awful lot more, and uh, in some ways can be both a lot more productive, but also potentially more uh, chaotic and destructive. Um, so its capabilities, it's really good at producing human sounding language. Um, it, anything it produces looks like it was written by a person. Um, it's good at any sort of uh, application that involves using language. That includes things like coding, because coding is fundamentally language, uh, summarizing text. Uh, it understands the requests that you give it um, and can both format things in various styles. So you can say, like, I want this as an email. I want this as a less formal email. I want this as a more formal email. Uh, but it can also refine things. So if you ask it to write an email and then you think that email is too formal, you say make it more informal. Uh, you can refine the, the previous thing. Uh, its limitations, though, I, I talked some about its limitations. The first and most important one is that it's not connected to any database of fact uh, yet. Uh, there's a little asterisk there because um, some versions of ChatGPT have some access to, well, not, not ChatGPT itself, but uh, ChatGPT is related to uh, Bing's new search that does have a connection to the internet. Um, and you can also provide it with information um, in various ways, but in, in its base way, it's not connected to any database of fact. Um, the training data that it was used on is not current. Uh, the set used to go up to uh, 2021. I think that GPT-4 has some slightly more recent uh, data, but that means if you ask it any questions about uh, you know, anything that happened after 2021, it's almost always going to uh, give you a bad answer. It's not meant for calculations or math. Um, there's some connection to, to some sort of like a calculating machine, but that's not what it's designed for. There's some limits on how many words that you can uh, put into it. It's about 3,000 words. The biggest uh, problem though is just that it's related to it not being connected to a database. It hallucinates uh, very convincingly. So if you ask it a question, it will almost always come up with a answer. But because it doesn't know anything, um, it will often come up with an answer that is at best uh, only statistically related to facts and sometimes just completely disconnected from it. Um, and then the last issue is that um, ChatGPT has guardrails related to certain uh, sensitive topics, uh, things like race, religion, gender, sexuality. Um, these, this is good because 
Otherwise, people would likely use ChatGPT basically as a tool of harassment. Um, but it uh, is a limitation. So say if you're a person who's studying the, the, the history of racial oppression in the United States, some prompts may you may run write into, write into issues where uh, you know ChatGPT say, would say like that's an inappropriate question. Um, I'm not willing to write about this. So sometimes you need to uh, have workarounds. Or another example is uh, personally identifiable information. Um, it doesn't want you to work with personally identifiable information. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, but sometimes uh, I was working with a program that had a uh, variable called purse name and uh, trying to get ChatGPT to refine it. Um, and ChatGPT would not because it had this one variable that was called purse name, but that it didn't want to, to touch that code. Um, so an example of uh, false information. So the information that ChatGPT has is based on its training data. So if you ask it to summarize the relationships between the characters in Star Wars, because an awful lot of, has been written about Star Wars, especially uh, on the internet, it does a really good job of uh, summarizing the relationships between all the characters in Star Wars. But if you go to the next slide, uh, if you write the same uh, prompt asking about a more recent novel, this is a novel that came out uh, just short, shortly before uh, the training data ends, and it's a much more you know, niche novel. Um, it, the first uh, description here is accurate, and everything after that is entirely made up. Um, it knows enough to have actual characters in the book, but the relationships that it's describing are uh, completely wrong. Um, a more, uh, you know, more academic example. If you write, ask it to write an introduction to an academic paper. Uh, it can write very convincing prose but it's not necessarily going to be related to any actual facts. Um, so if you keep on going to the next uh, things, so what you don't want to do is like ask it to create a bibliography of uh, journal articles. Um, this is something that Jonathan did really early on, and I think it's especially interesting. This is the bibliography it came up with given, if you go back to that prompt, the prompt is about uh, significant articles related to open access and citation advantage. Um, and if you ask it to come up with this bibliography, what's interesting about it is that some of these are actually real articles, but not all of them. So uh, if you go to the next slide here, four out of the 10 of these articles are real and six are not. So that this is particularly dangerous. Um, the fact that it, it not only comes up with convincing looking citations, but will occasionally create real citations. Uh, this can probably lure people into thinking that they might be getting accurate information when in fact it's just what uh, statistically looks like it should be. Uh, probably the most recent, well, uh, a recent example of this is that uh, there's uh, a lawyer in, I believe, Michigan uh, submitted a brief for a case uh, with um, a bunch of cases that did not actually exist. Um, I've had undergraduate students come to me asking for books that don't exist. Uh, they use ChatGPT to try to research things. They were looking for books about uh, gender and a clockwork orange, and they had a list of 10 books, and they said, why can't I find these? Um, I, I've seen, yes, uh, the DOIs, because it knows that an article looks like it should have a DOI. Um, and so it, do, it did create DOIs for all these articles. These DOIs don't lead anywhere, but it knows that a citation should have a DOI with a number that looks roughly like this um, and like that. So this is something that I think that we're, we're going to see an awful lot more of uh, in the next few years. People coming to us with citations that they're trying to locate um, for things that don't actually exist. Right, um, and at this point, I'm gonna pass it off to Jonathan and Jonathan's going to talk about uh, more potential impacts uh, in academic libraries. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about, um, you know, describing what we taught uh, the graduate students and the library staff here um, at UH Manoa, because um, we've kind of given an overview of what ChatGPT is, 
um, what it can do in a general sense and what it's really bad at. Um, but we wanted to help graduate students here um, use it in a good way, right? Because there are a lot of bad ways to use it and, and we're seeing that. Um, we wanted to help, help them navigate that. And kind of the first thing right off the bat that we're seeing in higher education, um, and I'm sure you know these news articles have come across your eyes as well. Um, you know, you saw how well it can write. You know, um, it can write, like David said, uh, at a level where if you have a freshman undergrad who's turning in that essay, it looks pretty good, right? It's not, it's not perfect, it's not professional quality, but um, it's good college writing. And so there's been a lot of concern about whether these kind of generative AIs will really change higher education, um, especially the writing aspect. And myself personally, I teach a class um, called GES 100, Global Environmental Science Seminar. You know, uh, this is a seminar for freshman students. You know, I, I show them library resources, teach them how to do, you know, uh, library research. And we have essay assignments in this class. So our essay number one assignment is um, shown here, um, you know, explore your environmental interest and experience, write a one to two page double spaced essay that identifies and discusses a scientific problem. Um, in your local community. So this is the prompt here. And you may have figured out from the, my screenshot is I've pasted this prompt directly into ChatGPT as well as the rubric that we give to students as to how their essay will be graded. So I just paste everything into ChatGPT's window. So I write an essay based on this prompt and follow this rubric and make it good, right? Um, and what you get out is what I would consider a, a decent essay um, that you know I would certainly pass for any student who turned this in, and um, I would not. It would not trigger my any reaction from me to say, "Oh, this is obviously written by a computer. Um, this student didn't put any thought into it." It it looks relatively good, right? It's it's talking about specific experiences in a specific place, and um, it's uh, entirely AI generated. And there's some people who think that, well, you know, we have AI tools for generating it. Why not also have an AI tool for detecting it, right? So um, there's a lot of, you know, startups and people rushing into the space saying, I can detect this. Um, you know, there was a big story about this college student who wrote this web app to detect the AI text. Um, and some people think this is gonna solve things, but unfortunately it's it's not easy, right? Because, you know, text is text and, you know, whether your, your fingers type it out or whether it's typed out by ChatGPT, um, you know, that sequence of words, there's nothing fundamentally different between a sequence of words that comes out of ChatGPT and a sequence of words that a student types. And so for all of the cases of these AI detectors, um, they make mistakes. So we have false uh, negatives. So I pasted in this exact essay that I generated um, from GPT and into this, this is uh, GPT zero, totally misses it. It has no idea that this is AI generated. Um, and possibly more dangerous is the reverse, right? So the false positive. So here we have um, a blog post that's written by a particular librarian. Um, he happens to be our university librarian here at UH Manoa, Clem Guthrow. And um, this is his blog post. And unfortunately for him, um, GPT-0 thinks that it's possibly AI generated. And uh, so hopefully he won't get kicked out of school for that. Um, but, uh, you know, the dangers are real in terms of uh, false accusations, because unlike in a plagiarism detector, right, there's no ground truth here. You can't go to the student and say, look, I found your essay you know, on the web, you know, you plagiarized it because it's the exact copy of what's already there. A generative AI is generating something completely new. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a new combination of words that isn't seen before. And so there's nothing to match it to. There's only um, a heuristic that says, well, maybe if you use words in a certain way, you're probably an AI. Um, but that can easily be gotten around by changing the prompt. If you ask uh, ChatGPT to write in a certain way, um, it makes it much less likely to be detected. And 
you know, a lot of formal types of writing tend to get detected as AI generated, because I guess, you know, we who write formal style, we're, we're more like computers. Um, and this is going on in addition to text in, in the image space as well. And so this is a New York Times article just from yesterday, in fact. I was, I was pleased to see it, and I wanted to include it. Um, there's AI image detection tools that are trying to you know, be developed, and they run into the same problems, right? So here's an example of a possibly, uh, possibly fake AI-generated image. It's unclear. Um, and if you pass it into these various image detectors, this particular image comes up as real. Probably not. Um, and then the opposite occurs as well. So they also have false positives, where if you feed it some actual photographs, uh, it will predict it to be AI. And again, like there, there are basically there are tricks you can use. Like if you add some like um, uh, some some fuzziness to it, it's much more likely to be real because just because the default AI generation is really you know pristine. Um, but you know it's it's very easy to fake these things. So, you know, in higher education, there have been discussions in various universities about strategies, you know, kind of the, the knee jerk reaction is to ban things um, and just say, you never use this again. Um, it's not appropriate for the university. Then kind of the middle ground is this avoiding um, the problem, say, well, we can keep with our old way of doing things. If we have an AI detector, then we're gonna just detect the people who use it in inappropriately. Um, or uh, I find it amusing that one strategy is kind of like a return to the, the past. Like maybe we bring back uh, blue book exams and have people write uh, in class essays um, instead of, uh, of doing things on their computers. Um, but uh, we try to advocate for incorporating this new technology, right? Um, how can you use it to improve your education? And this is what we try to teach the graduate students in this workshop. And we see this from some of our professors in the UH system as well. So this is um, an example of a website from um, a Leeward Community College professor who is incorporating ChatGPT prompts into their teaching. So um, providing example prompts to get students exploring a certain um, uh, you know, reading that they're doing. Um, and we think this is, this is a great way to go. And so when we did our graduate workshop, our advice to graduate students kind of fell into this category. Um, we taught them the features and limitations. We taught them that it, it generates and understands language, but it has this, you know, uncertain relationship with facts. Um, and, you know, maybe you shouldn't be using it to pass off as you're writing. Um, so can the bottom line, and it's what we want to emphasize today as well, is do not think of it as a search engine, but think of it as a language engine. So don't do either of these cases here below, right? Don't have it explain facts to you. Don't have it write things for you. Then what do you do with it, right? So I, I found that in most cases, it's very hard to get people to not think of it in the kind of database search engine model. I, I don't know if it's Google or whatever it is, but the last 20, 30 years, we've become like molded to this model where everybody sits down at it and asks the questions and tries to, if, to get facts from it. Um, and in the database that works because you're giving a query and the database has a body of information that it's drawing from. It has a bunch of articles in it and it's gonna give you an article and it's gonna give you that information's output. But in the LLM, the large language model, that's not true, right? So you're giving it instructions and it's looking at that as language and then it's outputting more language. And any information in it is just incidental to um, how it learned what language is, right? So it's not looking anything up. But there's a way around that. So if you provide it information, then because it can understand language, then it can take that source of true information that you provide it and it can manipulate it, it can read it, it can understand it, and it can give you output in language that then references that information source. So this was a lot of the kind of um, best practice method we tried to uh, present to graduate students. So what are the use cases that we presented? So one is it can do summarization. So 
if a graduate student is reading a you know detailed paper, um, they want to kind of extract it to its essence, you know, for their notes or whatever, they can include in their prompt portions of the paper and say, summarize this portion of this paper. What is this paragraph saying? Um, and it can organize what it finds. So in this, in this example, I have pasted in the introduction to a paper and I've said, find the citations in this introduction that are on either side of this debate about open access advantage. And it organizes it into the table like that. Um, and it can be very useful for me to then digest what that dense paragraph of text said. Similarly, it can produce study aids. So we taught graduate students how to use it to create question and answers, right? Flashcards. Again, out of a section of material that they provide to ChatGPT so that they minimize that chance of having hallucinations, false information, because you're giving it a paragraph of text and saying, make me questions about this text. One of the fun things that ChatGPT can do GPT can do is take on like different personas, right? That can be part of the instructions you give it. And so this was an example um, I, I provided to people who are preparing for, you know, uh, for graduate students, it was for an oral exam or, you know, their dissertation defense. Um, again, you, you put in your, your information from your dissertation and then you ask it to take on the persona of say a committee member. And, um, have it ask you questions that might come up in the defense. And uh, so this is from, from my dissertation. And I, I had it take on the persona of a picky committee member. Um, and all I can say is that I'm really glad that ChatGPT was not available to be uh, on my committee, because um, these might have been difficult to, to answer. Um, another funny thing, like um, David was mentioning about guardrails, is that you you can't actually ask it to be really mean. Like you can't ask it to be a, a, a hostile committee member because it says no one should be hostile in the world. And um, yeah, I wish that were the case. And, and it, I, I think it's a limitation, but um, it, it's, it's a funny drawback of it. Um, style changing is another extremely good use of it. So in this case, graduate students who, you know, maybe going to a conference or maybe preparing for a talk, maybe want to reduce the jargon that they're um, using to describe their research, you know, make it more publicly accessible. Um, so this is one thing I, I use in my class, in my GES 100 class. I tell undergraduates, because um, they're trying to create a poster to present to the public, you know, try to run it through ChatGPT and have it, you know, de-jargonize it, right? Like have it um, make it more accessible, use, use less jargon words and um, alter the writing style. Again, you're putting in that source of information, you're giving the instructions and you get the language output. Okay. So then what about the library uh, is in terms of our work, right? So there have been a few papers that have been published recently um, you know, publications move slowly, so it has not been a lot, but um, this is from ACRL um, about implications for academic libraries, and I went through this paper, and they list kind of these applications. Again, I'm seeing even at this level, there's some misunderstandings, so because the first one they mention is maybe it's a search engine replacement, um, but, you know, unless things really change and it really gets, you know, um, incorporated into Google or, or Bing in a, in a seamless way. I don't see that happening. Um, but uh, it, it presents some of the other ideas that we've already talked about in terms of brainstorming, summarizing. Um, obviously, it's, it's called chat GPT because it's meant to be a chat bot. And so, you know, kind of a natural thought is, can it be a library chat bot? Like, you know, we have chat reference here. Could it serve that role and interface with the public? Um, they talk about how it could help you write text for LibGuides, help you write textbooks. Um, and then they talk about, you know, uh, this is just going to create in general a need for more information literacy. Um, we've seen many examples uh, here at the University of people coming in and saying, where's this reference? Um, and it doesn't exist. And so that's going to be a, a problem going forward. Um, 
but I think that that was missing in its list a lot of what I see as the potential for this LLM technology in terms of basically dealing with any any time you're dealing with language because these can start to understand language. It's not just about writing or generating, it's about reading. And so um, a lot of these areas of academic librarianship where we are dealing with language, um, it could possibly play a role in. And so that's kind of abstract. So I wanted to walk through like one specific example where I'm, I'm pursuing this. Um, and that example is chat reference transcript evaluation. So, so this is not asking it to be the chat bot, right? It's not asking it to talk to pat patrons. This is going to be evaluating, um, in this case, the complexity of the chat reference interaction. So we have a chat reference service uh, here at UH Manoa. We have undergraduates who um, are in access services at the circulation desk. They are kind of the first line of triage and they get questions and um, hopefully they, if it's simple, like what are your hours, are you open, they can answer them or they can refer them to uh, reference librarians if it's more complicated. But um, we've always been interested in how complicated these questions are, how many are we getting to know if that's an appropriate um, service model, right? And so several times now in the past few years, we've evaluated these chat reference transcripts that we have um, for their complexity, right? And so we use this read scale, this uh, reference effort scale. Um, it's like a six point scale. Basically just, you know, it's like one is directional, two is a simple reference question, three is more complex and, and, uh, and so on. And um, to determine, you know, how many of each different complexity we have. And this is manual work, right? This is kind of tedious work that, you know, undergraduates do many hours of, um, reading each one and then scoring it. Um, and it's not that the technology to automate this was impossible before, but it was a major, it would, it would be a major project, right? It would involve um, getting, you know, thousands of examples of what's a one, what's a two, what's a three, you know, training this machine learning model. Um, it's not something you could do really quickly or without, without a lot of machine learning expertise. Um, but, can we use ChatGPT for this task? So again, for my screenshot, you can probably tell I'm pasting these in, right? So this is the scale and um, this is the scale from zero to six of, and the definition of each of the numbers. So I've pasted this into uh, ChatGPT. And then I paste in this chat interaction. And um, as a side note, this is another amazing thing about ChatGPT is it's incredibly robust to formatting, right? So I just copied this directly from our um, our um, Spring Share uh, data, and I didn't do any data cleaning. I didn't, you know, eliminate. You can see all of the quotation marks, and you can see some of the, uh, you know, HTML symbols in there. Um, it doesn't matter. Like it can, since it's reading the words, you know, for understanding. It it doesn't matter if there's stray tokens anywhere. Um, so I didn't do any cleaning like that. And um, this is the answer I get, right? So, so I ask it to score this and it tells me what it would score it. It gives me an explanation. And this is an example of that model I showed where um, you're giving it your information source, right? You're telling it, use this scale of definitions. Um, and then you're giving it instructions and you're giving it an input in source of transcripts. And you're asking it to analyze that as language and then it outputs the language, right? It's not drawing on a database. Um, it's not, you know, hallucinating in any way. Um, and so that you paste it in. So, so I don't know if you've seen the GPT, the window, it's basically just like, it's like a Google window where it's like, send a message, it's just one bar. Um, it doesn't really help you if you have to paste it in every single time, right? Cause we have 1200 of these chats, you know, just this year. I'm not going to do this 1200 times that I, I might as well just read them. Um, but there is an API, right? So this application programming interface allows you to interface with uh, ChatGPT kind of on the back end, right? So the computer to computer just talks to each other. You write a simple Python script and um, 
you pay some money because it's not the free interface, but you can do it thousands and thousands of times without having to do it manually. Um, so this is an example of you know the Python script that I wrote up for to do this. And um, interesting enough, like David mentioned, um, I had never done this before. And so you know I only co code in Python like once every so often. Um, but you know, ChatGPT can help a lot. So, so I asked it how to do this, and it basically walked me through this. Um, doesn't get everything right, but it kind of leads you on the, on the right path, um, a useful ability of it. And then it's not free. So using the API um, costs money per query. Um, someone say, you know, the, that free research interface is not free either because they're taking your data, right? Um, but that might be another question that we might discuss. Um, so it it costs per per word actually you send right and in this case since I'm using this GPT 3.5 turbo it costs um, you know two tenths of a cent per 1,000 words that are either sent or received now is that a lot or a little um, so this is kind of like the final the final uh, verdict um, so I did it for 1,200 you know I got all this data points out it, it gives me a score for each one. It gives me an explanation, and I, I, currently I'm going through these to see whether you know how accurate it was. Um, so far, it's it's relatively accurate, um, although there's like some disagreements with with how students do it. Um, but it's never like completely off base, it's, like never totally misunderstands the questions. Um, but traditionally, this would be maybe you could maybe do fifty to one hundred per hour per student. You know, it might cost you several hundred dollars of staff time to to create this data. Um, with, with this script, it cost me a dollar and 55 cents, um, in, in the API. So, but that, that is using that 3.5 model, which is kind of the, you know, previous generation, as you can see in these prices, this, uh, this is GPT-4, it's like 10 times more. So, um, that might change, change the, uh, the calculus. Um, okay. So that was, you know, one specific project that that I'm using it for. Um, there are a few others that I'm happy to talk about, um, but just to kind of to step back uh, in the general sense, you know, what are going to be the library impacts of this technology going forward? Um, one, people using it incorrectly. We've talked a lot about this. You know, people coming up with false citations because they think it's it's Google. Um, we're going to be seeing this a lot, and we're going to we're dealing with it. In the reference us now and it's going to increase um but not only that like even if people use it correctly like it's going to change how you know how our education is is run here at higher education um it's going to change how we interact with social media it's going to change many things um because just the, the cost of creating you know fluent language has basically dropped to almost zero um, how will that change things? Like that is still playing out. Um, then there's misinformation or bad actors, right? So like people actually using it to do phishing scams, um, you know, create misinformation, falsehoods. That's going to be an area we're going to we're going to have to deal with. We're going to have to try to educate um, as librarians. Um, and then in terms of library work, you know, there's writing. You can certainly use it for, you know, report generation or email writing. Um, any anytime you have to create boilerplate text, it's excellent that. Um, and then, like I showed, text analysis. And so this is an area that a lot of people haven't thought about much, but I'm I'm trying to figure out, you know, all the ways that we can use it where we read language, and we need to analyze it and output language. It could possibly play a role there. Um, and then the last thing is just constant change, right? So, you know, we started giving this in February. You know, things have changed already um, since we started giving this, and um, things are going to change more. Um, so this this bottom right tweet, this is an unreleased GPT-4 module where it can basically take in uh, like a data file and then automatically run code that you know creates figures about it. Um, creates graphs, analyzes it. Um, how that's going to impact like science is something to think about. Um, but things are going to change. So, um, so lastly, so that's that's our talk. 
Um, it's become a tradition now to kind of close with um, the more fun side of ChatGPT, where you can ask it to create some poetry. So uh, I asked it to create an epic poem about our, our uh, workshop to HLA. And um, as the last stanza says, uh, we call now for queries from the crowd. Speak your thoughts. In this space, questions are allowed. Um, and um, we hope you have questions and we hope we can, we can talk about things. Well, Jonathan and David, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I think there are a number of questions and comments in the chat. Um, so I th think we can jump over to the chat and Brian asked, does the date limitation have something to do with internal quality control? Uh, if you ask it if the citations are authentic or real, it will most likely tell you they are not. Any comments on that? Um, so the date limitation uh, was the original uh, training data. So the training data originally went mostly up to uh, 2021. Uh, um, and so it wasn't trained on newspaper articles or any other data that was any other text that was produced after 2021 so that's uh why that date limitation is there um we've talked some about the difference between uh gpt 3.5 and gpt 4 gpt 4 does include uh data that's more recent um and yes if you ask it if the citations are authentic or real sometimes it tells you that they are and sometimes it tells you that they're not but whether or not it tells you that they're real it has actually no relationship to whether or not they are real so um, that's one of the the other complications is if you show it a citation that it produced and says is this real it might tell you one way it might tell you the other if you say this isn't real then it will tell you oh yeah no that's not real because it's reacting to your input but if you tell it that a real citation isn't real it will also agree with you on that so um its answer is is it's not it, it's disconnected from the truth yeah um, Cindy commented that she tested ChatGPT last week and only one out of the 10 citations it gave me actually existed. So that's even worse than the example that you guys gave. Um, Pam said, doesn't that go against the grain of critical thinking? But I'm not sure what uh, comment, Pam, you were uh, referring to in your in your question. So if you could clarify, that would be helpful. Um, yeah. That's 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 when they were the slide where he was talking about using it to summarize other papers. I think it was I think it was other papers. It was I don't have a problem with using it to create a poster for a, you know summarizing your own paper for a presentation, but I'm concerned about the reduction of of teaching critical thinking skills for students. Um, if you're going to use it to summarize other papers and then, you know, you could use it to write your own literature review, but then are you really reading these papers if you're using chat GPT to read your paper, read the papers for you? I'd be interested in other people's thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think, I think the prob the, the, the potential for uh, problems is there. I mean, it's, it's, it's not really changed from, you know, back in the day, um, I don't know if they still have this, but there was cliff notes, right? Like you, you could always see those in, in, in Barnes and Noble of cliff notes of the, of the literature, you know, that danger of reading a summary instead of the actual um, work. Um, it's not new, um, but uh, this is another way to, to, to get at that. And um, we try to tell graduate students to use it responsibly, right? So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Brian commented that he was concerned for professional writers like journalists, authors, and script writers. Any comments on that? Well, I know that that's something that uh, script writers is definitely uh, worth calling out. That's why the, the Writers Guild of America is on strike right now, or part of the reasons why um, they are. Uh, very concerned that uh, AI and, and programs uh, like ChatGPT are going to be used to uh, take their jobs away. Um, and there are other organizations, I think uh, BuzzFeed laid off all of their writing staff and have outsourced uh, writing to, to programs like this. It's, uh, it's certainly a concern, 
Um, I, I think it's something that as a society, we, we have to learn how to uh, deal with. And I'm not sure if there's an easy answer to it, though, because the code is already out there. The, the programs are out there. And we have to, yeah, with that. Uh, Rachel asks, can it be used to help generate search terms for reference questions? Yes, that, that is a use case that I have played with it. Um, it is very good at that, right? So, um, you know, when I teach, you know, students, I always teach them to, you know, try to think of synonyms, right, or alternate terms. And, you um, you know, put yourself in the mindset of other people who might have worked on the same topic. And ChatGPT is amazing at that. Like, um, uh, you know, because that, that's a language task, right? It's, it's not an information task. Um, it's what language has been associated with these terms before. And so, you know, asking it to come up with 20 different, you know, alternate terms for a particular search can be extremely useful um, in, in, in searching. Great, thank you. Um, David Coleman, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of missing, maybe not time for really addressing this fully, but it's that um, I guess can do to all this and so I'm kind of struggling with the difference between um, traditional way of thinking about this, where you start with the database, you have a specific question, and you're expecting to get back an actual answer. Whereas what I'm seeing here is this is a bit different. There is sort of a question that's being asked, but the output is um, it's LLM, so it's not necessarily an answer, a quote unquote answer. So I'm um, having a couple of questions about what is the output if it's not an answer. And um, I think this slide you put up about potential web applications um, may address that. If you can go a little more detail about that particular slide, we had different inputs. I don't know which slide I'm talking about. Potential library application slide. Uh, let's see. Instead of having specific information, their database resource that had several several inputs that are put into the jetty. So I'm trying to figure how ways librarians can develop expertise in dealing with this as opposed you, you to you mean this slide? Yeah, that one exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So as librarians, we'd have to know the um, the most appropriate information sources to feed it, as yes. well as how how those instruct how those sources are to be used. Instructions for that, and I know what other input is necessary. But this kind of thought process, as opposed to um, traditional thing where you use what keywords and then you get out important keywords based on a database resource, then you get out an actual answer based on a fact, fact based answer. Yes, so, I think that's 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 a good way to think about it. Um, it is not a database. It has it has no reliable source of information. Um, so I guess if you if you want to think about the metaphor extended, so you can have a database like as a platform, as a software, and in this case, not only do you have to create the search query, you have to choose what articles go into it, right? Um, because you can't trust that any any of the information in there is accurate. Um, right. But if you give it that information, then you can trust it to, you know, do an operation on that mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. So could you say, for instance, if mission source, you could say, um, use Science Direct, just to pick something. Use Science Direct as information source. Um, and I don't know what instructions you'd have to give it. And I don't know what other input you would need to use because from the, well, an input would be a query from a patient. patient. Yeah. In the future, that might be possible. Now, the, the mm -hmm. problem is, like we mentioned, there is an input limit. Um, and, and at the moment, it's actually quite small, right? Mm -hmm. So for, for GPT 3.5, it's about 3,000 words. For GPT 4, mm -hmm. it's about 8,000 words. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's not enough to put in all of Science Direct, right? right? It's it's actually not even enough to put in an entire academic paper. So you um, need some kind of specialized API to check to condense the yes, information from something like Science Database and then feed it in automatically. That's, that's right. And these context windows are growing quite quickly. So there's there's you know there's rumors on the horizon that within the next year we'll have a hundred thousand word you know context window. In which case you're talking about like a book length, right? So. Um, that is an area where technology is is not staying still and, and things are going to change but um eventually you could imagine something like that where look at this entire corpus of literature let's talk about it and it, it's verified but right now that's not true also i'm thinking that because it's a language-based thing the quality and the sophistication of the question needs to be stepped up if you're going to make use of this you can't use a simple you know, like I'm dealing with medical libraries, you have a typical format called PICO, you know, what's your population right. dealing with, you know, what's, what's the, um, the, what are you trying to, what are you trying to um, input, you know, what right. is, what is the input and then what are you comparing to, what is your desired output, it's going to be far, the questions be far more sophisticated. Yes, and, and, and you know, to the extent that, you know, that area of art of, you know, how to ask questions of these LLMs, you know, some people call it prompt engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really in its infancy, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, because the way these neural networks work, they're black boxes, actually, no one really knows, like, how you should word something in order to get a certain output out. It's like, yeah. it's kind of like, it's like magic spells. It's right. like, you can come up with some way to word something that will make it go in some completely new direction mm -hmm. that no one has ever done before. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a lot to learn about this. Like I, yeah. I mentioned briefly about take on this persona, you know, change this style. Like there's, these are shortcuts you can do to make it do these various things. But there's a lot that we still have to learn about how to develop a standardized you know, Pico method. There's nothing like that yet. And so people have to understand what the output is, because the output isn't an answer necessarily. Mm -hmm. the That's output right. Is an, I don't know what you call it. It's not an answer. What is it? Never really sure. A statement, a flight of fancy, um, hallucination. I don't know what you want to call the output. I mean, technically, it's the most likely. Uh, it's the most likely text that would follow your input. Right, <laughs> that, that's what it's trying to do. It's trying mm -hmm. to give you the text that it thinks is most likely to follow your input. So is that an answer? It, it's, it's unclear. Yeah, um, we have time for about one more question before we have to sign off. So uh, Kimo asked, uh, is there a potential for eliminating the need for librarians, especially academic librarians? Um, any thoughts on that question? Uh, I, I will say not yet, um, and hopefully not, but it will certainly change our jobs. Yeah, I, I will say that I think that the, the most immediate, I mean, in the far future, who knows, right? Um, but in the near future, I think the most immediate change will be, it's going to change our jobs, and it's going to change instead of eliminating librarians, it might change, you know, um, what skill set librarians might need to have, um, because it has the potential of letting you do a lot more, like being a lot more productive. And so um, it might be a skill that people need to develop, right, to, as as the job changes. To maybe you to need take a, a, oh. you need a whole yeah. different vocabulary to deal with this stuff. Yeah, well, we we are always in the learning business. We are always having to learn new tools, new uh, skills, new techniques, and so forth. So chat GPT just kind of fits into that whole model. Well, we are just about at time. So um, I'm sorry that if we didn't get to any uh, people's last questions, but thank you so much, Jonathan and David, for your presentation. We really appreciate it. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this uh, session has been recorded and it will be posted on our um, HLA YouTube. Um, so um, thank you all so much for joining us and we will look forward to seeing you at a future uh, Next Steps program. Mahalo.